process. If you do a large beach nourishment project, project, you are preventing overwash from getting to the backside of the barrier. If the backside of the barrier has an inlet, you're are you going to accelerate the backside of the barrier while temporarily saving the front side? <coughs> in, in other words, increase the erosion on the backside. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so you know, nourishment is, I didn't talk about nourishment, thanks for pointing that out, right? So nourishment, which is already a pejorative term because it, it insinuates beaches are hungry things that need to be fed. But nourishment is, is dumping of, of extra sand on a beach, right, or pumping it from one place to another um, you know, to make the beach bigger again, right, which is a way to counteract some of the problems when you have a sediment budget um, that's not working your way. Right? So first of all, nourishment doesn't stop the fact that there was already an erosion problem there, just like seawalls don't stop the fact that there was already um, an erosion problem there. What nourishment does do is, it is over the life of the project, it can give you more more a, a beach that's sandy or, or usable and then offers protection from storms generally. Now, um, what Jim was talking about is what happens if you have a barrier and you just keep on building sand out in front, it doesn't stop the fact that sea level is, is rising, right? So maybe one of the things to think about is not just to put the sand on front, but to actually start pumping the sand on the actual barrier itself would be one of the few ways to um, counteract the fact that that barrier is drowning in place. But you're asking about how that might affect erosion on the back of the barrier, right? Yeah, there have been a number of projects around the country over the years that have been studied that where even, even sand fencing and, and large beach nourishment projects are preventing the overwash. Yes. And I, I, I noticed that a lot of folks are not looking at what's happening on the back side of the barrier. They're concentrating on the front. And the back side of the barrier is accelerating an erosion. You're losing a lot of the resources and affecting yeah. waterfront property on that side. So it depends what your environment is on the back of a barrier, right? It could be a marshy environment, in which case you'd be having these changes because it is experiencing sea level rise. Or if it's a sandy area, it could be um, wave impact. But yeah, it's not going to affect what's going on in the back part of the barrier at all by having nourishment. Um, and in general, people further back from the beach might benefit less and less from a nourishment project and the people exactly right on front of the beach tend to benefit a lot more. So yeah, I guess if you're in the back of the beach, you'd be, well, no one really wants a bunch of sand dumped in their yard either though, do they? So it's a, it's a, it's a balance. Yeah, um, I just was wondering, you know, there's about 300 years worth of historical data on the outer cape for erosion, from aerial photographs, et cetera. And you talked about a foot of sea level rise in the last hundred years. Have you guys looked at the comparison over that time frame to see if erosion has actually been increasing? Because I can't tell from looking at CZM transects and stuff that, that the rules you're talking about have actually been working that way. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions. So the, the, the principle of the Bruin rule is a good one. There's actually been a lot of debate of actually seeing it um, actuated in nature, right? Some of these other ideas about how barriers move over time, over thousands of years, there's more geologic evidence for how those things behave um, than the Brune rule. And the problem is getting enough long-term data that averages over the variability of storms and other things and finding places where you know, the, the alongshore gradients in transport aren't the things that are dominating what's going on um, as far as beach erosion, right? So as well as we really only have, um, you know, imagine you were trying to do a climate projection and you only took the temperature know, once a year, you know, for the last hundred, well, once every several decades for the last hundred years, right? And the thermometers weren't very good in 1860. Anyway, so we have a very few data points to try to figure out shoreline change from. You don't know where it is in the wiggling as well as um, the first thing to, the, the piece out, especially for the, the Cape, is um, what the alongshore gradients are. And those things might be dominating, especially a lot of the outer Cape as well. So. How, are there, is there much evidence of an acceleration or an increase in erosion? I don't think we have enough long-term data to be able to assess that, and, and especially long-term quality data. I mean, aerials are about the best you can get, but we don't have, we, we'd like to have a tight series of those as well.
Andrew, I'd like to ask one question. Within your, and this is to Jeff also, through both presentations, you've never used the word wind. And I know a lot of times meteorologists are using the word storm to, to equate wind, but here we're local. And as, and as we're on the water 200 plus days a year, over the last 10 years, there have been observations that wind is increasing. Is that wind that is, is it, in fact, increasing? Is it a part of your budget equation? You would think that when we talk about wave, wave action generated on the surface by wind, winds are changing to the north over the last three years specifically. Now, how is that affecting us as planners and local water people who have to deal with getting up every morning and saying, what am I dealing with out there? Um, but yeah, so we didn't talk about wind. I mean, some, it depends what the, um, I don't, know, I don't know much about the increase there, but waves, of course, are generated by, by wind. So one of the things I tried to, I guess I, I touched upon, was that shifts in the wind right, can actually, if, if they change where the waves are coming from. Remember, you know, some places our waves are generated locally, and some of them, they come pretty far away, and they're generally you know, from, from the bigger storm events is when we get most of the, the waves that really affect coastline change. But some places, these, these small locally generated uh, winds are the things that really affect the coast, right? And shifts in those can have pretty profound effects on the shape of the coast, right? And that they could even overwhelm, um, you know, they could potentially in some places you could end up with an accretion that would overwhelm your loss because of sea level rise, right? But of course in the other areas, you might get a double whammy of erosion due to sediment budget along shore as well as erosion due to increase. Seen any balance between, let's just buy into climate change, sea level rise, would that then equate to more wind? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there, those, there are many projections, but as Jeff was showing you, there's, there's a lot of different of these global climate models, and they don't all agree on things um, like the exact wind fields and the wind direction is something trickier to tease out of these models. Um, you know, where something like sea level rise is, is a pretty general one-way trend well, with the with an arrow pointing up. Um, but there's no reason to expect that we shouldn't see changes in that. We've seen changes in, in precipitation and droughts. Jeff's looked at that a lot over the last several thousand years and things like that. So, yeah. We'll take one more, two more. Uh, Eric Nelson. Um, the sites uh, where overwashes occur uh, often tend to be the same sites that breaches occur. And I was wondering if you might explain um, what some of the conditions that lead to a breach um, may be uh, as opposed to simply an overwash zone. Yeah, so, I, so overwash, right, is, is when there's um, Sometimes there's funneling or fans of overwash that occur. In some cases, it's very localized, and you can actually excavate a channel that then tides can, can keep open um, over time. Right? In some cases, um, depending on where you are, there's places in Long Island that breach, and then waves fill those breaches back up very quickly. Right? We have um, on Katama, we have right, an inlet that, was, that gets formed about every 40 years by a breach and then migrates its way down, and then is followed by another breach that migrates its way down uh, towards the tip of Martha's Vineyard. So uh, the things that are more likely to make uh, a breach occur would be you know, a, a, a deeper point, um, as well as it depends upon the characteristics of the storm as well. Sometimes uh, it depends whether the storm has infilled the, the back of the lagoon a lot. Sometimes breaches occur from the back, and sometimes they occur from the front. So it's it's tricky to predict, but at a certain point, breaches also are another way of sending sediment 
to the back area to help build a platform for a barrier to move on to as well. Did I miss your question somehow? No, I, I, that helps. Uh, I'm just curious if, if we see it, a greater tendency in overwashes um, and we don't see any new material moving into the system, um, are we going to see a net uh, loss of, of material, say, and an eventual breach? Would that be expected under those <coughs> circumstances? Yeah, so more overwash would make it more likely to have a breach. Now, as far as keeping many inlets open, that has to do with how big your tidal basin is in the back, right? So Jeff showed the stuff from North Carolina, which actually Pamlico Sound has a very small oscillation compared to tides. That's because there actually aren't enough inlets. And it seems like 400 years ago, they popped open enough inlets that the whole thing is now, was able to keep in sync, right? As you increase your tidal range, you increase the flows through the inlets and keep them open, right? Most of our tidal basins here are probably keeping up with, with um, you know, just keeping one channel because we have much smaller lagoons than in other places. But breaching should increase is something to, to expect. All right, but well, I think we're going to stop the questions there and thank Andrew for um, <coughs> thank you. the talk.